Welcome back to DCS Debrief. Uh, thanks for coming back. Before we get started on this video on turning, I want to make a couple of disclaimers. Firstly, I'm not a fighter pilot. These videos are not authoritative. They're based on my own experience in real aviation where it's applicable. Uh, also, open source but official documents on the subject and also my own discussions with former fighter pilots who I know. It's presented for critique and to add to the overall body of information available online about air combat in simulation games such as DCS World. As with many tactics, techniques and procedures, there are real differences in application between the game world and real life. And as such, these presentations are only relevant to the game. I hope you enjoy. So in this video, we're going to talk about turning in the context of BFM. Bandits won't fly straight and level and let you kill them. They'll turn, they'll present you BFM problems, and you'll need to understand the geometry of turning to solve these problems, and in turn present BFM problems when you're defensive. In order to understand the best way to turn, we need to understand how aircraft turn and what affects their turn circle. The aim of this video is to describe the dynamics of a turning aircraft in the context of BFM, and explain the language necessary to understand future turning concepts. In the last video, we covered some of the principles of BFM, and in particular, we defined some terms which I'm going to use in this presentation. And by the end of this video, you should be able to understand the key definitions relating to aircraft turn concepts in BFM, understand the difference between turn rate and turn radius, and understand the effect of gravity on turn performance. This presentation is limited only to turn dynamics. The interplay between two turning aircraft will be the subject of the next video on pursuit, and future videos in the BFM series. Also, this presentation relies on a good understanding of a lot of underlying aerodynamic concepts or a willingness to push the I believe button a lot. If I get enough feedback, I might do a video on these subjects, but I'd prefer to stick to the applied stuff as there's a lot out there already on more general aviation topics. Linked in the video description, I'll leave the published references for this work, as well as a list of resources and tools that I use to complete any calculations. So let's start with some definitions. First of all, turn circle. An aircraft flying in a still air mass in a balanced level turn with a fixed angle of bank will describe a perfect circle in space. The path traced by a turning aircraft is called the turn circle and will actually vary according to conditions and aircraft performance. The post is a notional position at the centre of the turn circle similar to the post used for round the pole model aircraft. If anybody remembers those, it's used as a reference point for positioning. Turn rate is the rate of change of a turning aircraft's heading measured in degrees per second. And turn radius is the radius of the turn circle or the distance from the post to the aircraft. So what's the difference between rate and radius? Turning tight and turning fast are not the same thing. Neither is going to guarantee success in BFM. We'll come on to that in later videos, but for now, pure geometry can tell us a lot about turning. Because aircraft use the lift vector to turn, the rate of turn depends on how much lift you can produce, which is a function of angle of attack and airspeed. The fighter here is turning right with a radius of 1,900 feet at 265 knots and pulling 3.3 g. The bandit is turning right at 525 knots and has a turn radius of 3,250 feet at 7.5 g. Now these figures would be true of anything, fighter aircraft, cars or buckets of water on a piece of string. They're just physics and geometry. You might think that the tighter circle would be the quickest way around the corner, but turn rate depends solely on how quickly aircraft can fly around the circle. So using pure geometry and speed distance time, we can calculate the turn rate. And here, the fighter is turning at 13.4 degrees per second and the bandit at 15.6 degrees per second. This bandit will complete a 180 degree turn roughly two seconds quicker than the fighter. So, with little more than elementary geometry, we can show that turn rate and turn radius are different concepts. For BFM, we need to understand the limitations on rate and radius, and these limitations are dependent on two things. Firstly, the geometry itself, and this applies to all aircraft equally. And secondly, aircraft performance characteristics, and these vary according to aircraft type, loadout, and even altitude. To increase turn rate, the fighter can increase speed while maintaining radius, simply covering the same distance in less time but this increases the turning force required and means the fighter must produce more lift while the turn itself will generate more g-force. At some point during this acceleration, the fighter will become limited. Increasing lift means increasing drag and eventually drag will equal thrust and the aircraft can go no quicker and turn no faster. This is where thrust to weight ratio starts to play a part and this is where aircraft begin to differ. If plenty of thrust is available, g-force will gradually increase until the aircraft maximum load factor is reached or the pilot can no longer remain conscious. Consciousness, of course, being an important prerequisite to success in BFM. So the answers can't be to fly as fast as possible and just heave the aircraft into a turn at the maximum G it can sustain, because then you're limited by maximum G around a wider radius than necessary. We'll talk more about this later. So is slower better? 
While at 525 knots true airspeed, the Bandit has a higher turn rate, but is pulling 7.5 g, which is their load factor limit. Reducing to 475 knots decreases the radius to 2,900 feet for the same turn rate at only 6.7 g. At this speed, 7.5 g is still achievable, but more drag means the aircraft will then decelerate. As our pilot reduces to 370 knots, the sustained turn rate decreases only slightly to 15.3 degrees per second and the radius collapses down to 2,250 feet. The aircraft will sustain this at 5.3 g. By 265 knots, the Bandit can only sustain 3.3 g and is turning to match the fighter. Getting to the load limit at this speed is now impossible because if the pilot continues to pull, the wings will reach critical alpha, the aircraft will stall, or stall protection systems will limit inputs. The point just before this, where the wing is producing the maximum lift for that speed, is called the lift limit. Now I said I would come back to a couple of points. So far we've only discussed sustained turns. Instantaneous turn performance is entirely governed by the lift limit or the load limit, and the pilot can pull to whichever one they hit first, temporarily increasing their turn rate as a result. Where these limits converge, the greatest possible rate of turn is available, and this is known as corner airspeed. Any faster, and a pull to lift limit would overstress the machine any slower than corner and there's not enough airspeed to deliver the lift necessary to reach the load limit. Combat configured aircraft generally can't sustain corner speed. Instead, they decelerate due to drag so that huge turn rate is fleeting and the pilot must decide on when to ease off to a sustainable rate. At some point there will be a range of speeds which all have roughly similar sustainable turn rate. Our notional aircraft has enough power to sustain a turn rate of 15.3 degrees per second at between 325 knots to 370 knots. This is our tactical rate band. So which speed to choose? Well, the faster you're going, the wider your radius, and an opponent could exploit this. So you could go slower without a rate disadvantage. However, excess speed allows a greater instantaneous turn rate if you need it. An exchange of speed for angle is known as an energy excursion. This is effectively an energy debt, and it'll need repaying. At 325 knots, you don't have much speed to convert, and afterwards you'll have a very reduced rate at low speed in an aircraft with very high angle of attack that is probably becoming a handful just to keep in the air. However, an excursion from the upper end of the tactical rate band will still yield an instantaneous turn rate increase, but will leave you still able to perform at a relatively high sustained turn rate if you only bleed within the band. On the other hand, minimum radius speed is generally much slower than max rate, but might leave you so slow that your roll rate suffers and the turn can't be reversed fast enough to utilize the advantage. The options are there for you to choose, depending on the bandit, and what you decide to do will be influenced by your knowledge of your own aircraft, your opponent, and the BFM principles. And there are lots of graphs available to explain this stuff. You'll be able to find some of them online. They're called energy maneuver diagrams. But I'm going to try and keep things applied here because no one chart can account for all the variables, not least of which is vertical maneuvering. I just spent a lot of your time implying that the rate and radius were geometrically predefined at given airspeeds, but this isn't necessarily true. In a level turn, the lift vector is around 90 degrees to the weight vector, so gravity has no impact on turn performance. It's all about lift, thrust and drag. If I roll inverted though, I'm at minus 1g when I'm flying straight and level upside down. If I pull to 0g, I have no angle of attack, I've literally no g applied, but I'm still turning. So what's going on? This is what you might hear called God's G, and it's most effective when you're purely inverted. The effect reduces until it's zero when you're purely vertical down, but at this point gravity is giving your engines a big hand, so the greater effective thrust reduces your bleed rate. This means diving adds gravity to thrust and improves available instantaneous turn rate, provided you have height. Pulling up, God's G works against you, so a vertical turn at a constant G doesn't look like a circle, it looks like an egg. On the way up, gravity adds to drag, reducing available instantaneous turn rate. At least once you've got up there, you've got altitude that you can cash in by diving, as I described a moment ago. So no single airspeed value will give you an advantage. It depends on height, orientation, and the ability to convert potential energy into kinetic and vice versa. An aircraft may not have the height required for a pure vertical reversal, because these take up a lot of room. And running out of space, going downhill, and flying into the deck, that's not desirable. Another aircraft might lack the speed to go straight up, so it's more useful to estimate at the aircraft's total energy state, and this is referred to as the energy package. So in conclusion, regardless of type, all aircraft turning at the same G and the same speed will have the same rate or radius, but these are no guarantee of success in BFM. Knowing your optimum turn rate speed and best turn rate band will give you the ability to go around the corner the fastest, but this still might not be enough. 
You'll need to compare your advantages and weaknesses to those of your bandit, assess both aircraft's energy package, and devise a game plan to force the bandit into part of their envelope that suits you and not them. There's lots more to cover on the way to mastery of BFM. In the meantime, pick your favourite aircraft and DCS, load up an empty mission and experiment. Maths will tell you what turn rate and radius you'll get for a particular speed and G, and you can use the tools in the description for that. But only by experimenting will you figure out what your favourite aircraft will sustain, how it bleeds energy, and what it's like to handle at low speed. While you're there, have a go at some dogfighting before you watch the next video in the series. When you come back, you'll probably have a much better sense of the concepts and context that the rest of this series will explain, and you'll have seen a lot of the problems that it will describe. Now, that's probably the first video on YouTube where you've been asked not to click like and subscribe, but seriously, don't. Double click on the DCS icon instead, and get experimenting, make mistakes, have fun, and tell me how you get on in the comments. I'll see you when you get down.